Good morning, and the Lord be with you. Welcome to the Vicarage for another Light Bite. We started a new series last week on big words. I suppose that's the right way to describe it. Uh, the reasoning is that big words, technical words, always shortcut an idea. It's important to get the idea. It's always possible to deal with any topic using um, simpler language. It just takes a bit longer. Anyway, last week I thought I'd better start on familiar ground, so I picked the word God. This week I'm going to deal with Christ. And for a Christian, um, I would say that probably makes a bit of sense. <clears throat> well, let's hear from the Bible. Three short readings now. Three short readings. First one. Matthew 16, 13 to 17. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. John 20, 30-31 Many, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. 1 John 2, verses 22 to 23. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. I remember it well. One of our lecturers asked us a simple question. What does the word Christ mean? One of us said, anointed. The lecturer then said, plastered. It means plastered. And we sat there astonished. And he repeated, it means plastered. All right, let's have a quick think about the word Christ. In New Testament Greek, Christ is Christos, and it means anointed. It translates an Old Testament Hebrew word, Mahiach, Messiah. So we're actually dealing with three words, not one. Christ, anointed, and Messiah. All meaning exactly the same thing, plastered. Of course, we're less than happy with plastered, aren't we? Because we're talking about Jesus Christ. And we don't like to use words and expressions of him that to us are not dignified. But the Old Testament word is about having olive oil poured over you. And it stands for specialness, recognition, importance, blessing. The tabernacle, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, is anointed with oil. That's it, in Exodus 40. Garments are anointed in Leviticus 8. Religious leaders were anointed with oil. Uh, that's also in Leviticus 8 and 1 Kings 19. Honoured guests, really, this is the meaning of Psalm, the Psalm 23 um, reference. Honoured guests are anointed with oil. So that word, Messiah, Christ, anointed it's about having olive oil poured on you 
The Psalm 133 is interesting because it puts it pictorially, really. It's a very short psalm, and it talks about the blessings of a priestly brotherhood. Behold, it says, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. We think of that as pretty messy, but it wasn't in the Old Testament. It wasn't um, seen that way. Eleven Old Testament kings, including Saul, David and Solomon, are described as having been anointed. They're anointed with oil. And that was, for them, that was like being crowned. The meaning of that is that they were, um, they were set apart as holy or consecrated in their role. And they were given authority of some type. In the Old Testament, anointed one became a synonym for people chosen, appointed, consecrated, and equipped for high office royalty, basically. It has a priestly application, too. Remember Psalm 133. When, when I was ordained priest, the bishop laid his hands on my head and, and, and prayed. In Old Testament times, that would in, involve having Olive oil poured on my head, lots of it. One of our problems in, in trying to imagine is that we have a job, job to get a grasp of what it would look like in an ancient, non-technological, non-English society. So Jesus is God's anointed one, his Messiah, his Christ. And he's described that way in John 1 and John 4 and Acts 4. But now... The word Messiah is linked with others, uh, with other words, saviour, redeemer, things like that. Okay, I'm hoping that you're still with me. I'm going to go back into the Old Testament. Now it's worth asking where this concept of Messiahship came from. Where did the idea of anoint, an anointed saviour come from? And for this, I'm suggesting that for a moment we go back into the books of Joshua and Judges. They're historical books. We're not going to read them, but by all means, do have a look. I want to tell you that they describe behaviour and consequences. And a pattern is repeated over and over again through those two books. The people sin. Then God sends an oppressor, an invader. And then the people cry out to God in their misery and pain. And then God appoints and sends a saviour. And that happens over and over again. It's not the only place it happens. Now, within the history of Israel, 722 BC, because of the people's outrageous injustice and idolatry, the emperor of Assyria invaded the northern half of Israel. And really, that was the end of it. But in 597 and 587, for the same kinds of reasons, God appointed Babylon to invade the southern half of the kingdom. Babylon steamed in, um, sacked the temple, shipped everyone capable off into exile, and hundreds of miles from home, the Jewish people, pleaded with God for someone to save them a Messiah, see the patterns there and from Isaiah 42 onwards there is the promise of a rescuer who turns out when it happens to be a foreigner actually Cyrus, king of Persia and he allowed the Jewish people to return and finance the rebuilding of Jerusalem now He's described in Isaiah 45 as God's anointed. And you must realize the importance of this because the Jewish nation considered itself God's chosen people and believed that one day every nation on earth would come knocking on the door of Jerusalem to worship the one true God at the Jewish temple. So it's odd that Cyrus is described as God's anointed. 
When the people returned, it wasn't quite so straightforward as a rescue. Only about 5,000 of them came back to rebuild, rebuild Jerusalem. And then they faced lots of, issue, uh, of opposition. And the, the uh, Persian Empire was overtaken by the Greeks. And then eventually the Greek Empire was overtaken by the Romans. And there were some pretty dark moments. And so the Jews, now here's the, the crucial thing here. The Jews who had expected God's anointed one to rescue them from exile now expected a Messiah, a saviour, God's anointed one, to rescue them from the Romans who invaded their country. They expected a soldier king. And it was still like that. That was still their expectation when Jesus was walking the earth. Now, I'd better give you a rest for a moment. Let's have a hint, because we're not finished yet. Let's have a hint. Jesus, 
Jesus Christ. And that, of course, means Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the Anointed One. Jesus manifestly didn't have any interest at all in kicking out the Romans. But the idea that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, is there all the time in the New Testament. The word Christ, to remember that Christ is not a, a name but a title. The Christ is used nearly 530 times in the New Testament. Curiously, we could say, that Jesus was simply a teacher and a healer. Uh, we could say in today's terms that he was an influencer. But you find some pretty big statements about him in the New Testament. Um, all four Gospels confidently affirm that Jesus is the anointed one, the, or Christ, or Messiah. Um, when the Apostle John summarized his, summarizes his reason for writing about Jesus' life, he says... Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have, have life in his name. In the same gospel, John's gospel, Martha says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all highlight Simon Peter's declaration, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, we read the one from Mark, of course. Matthew and Mark both start out with the idea that Jesus is the Christ. In Matthew's gospel, it says several times that Jesus is the son of David. David was God's anointed king. Paul opens his letter to the Romans by telling us that God's son Jesus was descended from David. So the same idea is implicit there. 1 John 2, we find that whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, of course the Messiah, the anointed one, is a liar. That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? So what's going on here? Key is the idea that we are still oppressed. We are oppressed, not by a foreign power. We're held prisoner by our own failings, our own sin. Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, or continue to fall short of the glory of God. No matter how good we are, we can't deserve God's mercy or help. And um, to that, you might well reply something like, well, I disagree, I'm not that bad really, I try to get, live a good life. I don't harm people. But actually, when the standard is utter holiness, even claiming to be not so bad is a sin. It's trying to mask the failures and the faulty motives. We're all in the same boat. We need help. And so God gives us his anointed one, his Messiah, his Christ, Jesus, his son. And Jesus takes all of our sins on his shoulders, pays for it by his death on the cross. Jesus is actually anointed as Messiah in his baptism. He's baptized, the Holy Spirit descends on him. And there is the, um, the voice of God consecrating him as Messiah. So in Christ, God pays for our sin because we can't. It's not just an idea, you know. It's the centre, the absolutely central idea of Christianity. And that's why Christianity is uh, fundamentally not about our slavishly trying to be good because God might reward us. It's about responding to Christ, trusting Christ, having a personal relationship with Christ having faith in Christ, God's Messiah. Christ is not so much somebody to imitate as to trust, to serve. And the main message of the church is not love thy neighbour. Um, it's not inclusivity, there's another modern one. It's not care for the world, it's Christ. When we have Christ in the centre, We'll do all the other stuff. 
without Christ in the centre, we are dragged down by our own sin. There is a saying, which I've modified slightly. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been a technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us Christ, our Saviour. And with that, I've got to finish. Because um, this has gone far too, too long. Let's have another hymn and then we'll close with a prayer.
us pray together. Lord God, thank you for all your goodness to us. From the good earth on which you placed us to the glorious Christ, your Messiah, your anointed one, our Saviour, who came to die for our sins and preside over our new life in him. Thank you, because in Christ, our home is in heaven. Help us, Lord, in our lives to trust Christ for our salvation and to live every day in him in this world. Help us to thirst for more of him. Help us to make the Lord Jesus Christ the centre of our world. Protect us, Lord, from complacency and from the pride of thinking that we are, are somehow good enough. And may it be, Lord, that those around us will be able to see our Christ-centred life and marvel and want some for themselves. And in his name we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep all our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us today and always. Amen. Amen. I hope you're having a good weekend.